and have been very poor and in, incapable of dealing with simply because they're not geared to do it. So I want, to, I want to, 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 to extend our appreciation and my appreciation to them for what they do because that's a crucial part of the market that needs to be dealt with and cannot be dealt with by other groups other than people like themselves who specialise in that area. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. I'll take Deputy O'Brien as well, please. Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks both for the, the presentations. Uh, and just to say, I've worked with a number of, of clients from your facility in British Bay post their uh, uh, departure on their housing needs in the constituency, and they speak very, very highly uh, of, of their time there. Three questions. Do you receive any government funding at all for the work you do? First of all, I'd just be interested to know if you're in receipt of any state uh, uh, funding. Secondly, your proposal in terms of rent supplement seems eminently sensible, uh, and the amount of money that it would require from the state would be very, very small, given uh, in real terms the small numbers of people that we're talking about. So I'd just be interested to know, have you ever had communication from the Department of Social Protection at a senior level or current or former Minister for Social Protection just on the issue as to what the resistance would be? Because again, it would just seem like an eminently sensible and affordable proposition, uh, and one would I'd support. Uh, and the third question is, one of the issues that certainly I've come across in the constituency is that, um, and not unlike your own story, Niall, people who are, are living through addiction and homelessness, they go into re residential rehabilitation, and when they come out of residential rehabilitation, of course, they're still homeless. And the only emergency homeless accommodation are relatively low threshold emergency uh, accommodations, say, in the city centre here in Dublin, that would have a relatively high volume of active drug use uh, in the dormitory accommodation, which, of course, somebody just had a detox isn't going to want to go to. It forces them to sleep rough and creates a kind of another cycle. Uh, so I'm just wondering, do you have any recommendations to the committee as to how that specific kind of difficulty for people coming out of residential rehabilitation uh, uh, could be addressed that we could then put to the Dáil and the Minister when we make a report? Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. Just before I uh, revert to Mr McCarthy and Mr Thompson, uh, Deputy O'Brien, just to remind you that at private session this morning when we were outlining the forthcoming witnesses over the next couple of weeks, the Department of Social Protection is one of those and it's an issue that we may want to probe with them, just to remind okay. you. Uh, Mr McCarthy. Um, just as regards uh, Deputy Durkin's question um, regarding are we an approved housing body, um, we organically we have grown into providing transitional housing, not because we ever wanted to, it's because uh, people such as Niall who have exited the programme have found it difficult to get back on their feet. So we, um, Wicklow County Council, approached us and, and have approached us many times to take on a transitional house for them. So in the, in the meantime, we've ap applied for um, housing uh, approval with, uh, with the Department of the Environment. As, and uh, that is literally in train at the moment and is pending. Um, it is interesting. We had a graduation uh, last week, Deputy Durkin, and one of the guys who graduated, and he lived on the beach in Wicklow. He was, he was homeless. And he just gave his story at the graduation. He's saying he went into Wicklow County Council and in their offices he was there and he said I've nowhere to go and he said I have to I need treatment I'm in addiction but I'm homeless and they rang Tig Lynn so Wicklow County Council saw that hold on a sec this guy uh, can get help up there I'm delighted to say when he came in we, we, we had problems because he was very moody as he said himself and he, he didn't want to fill in any firm, forms it turns out the chap was illiterate he didn't have couldn't read or write so there's a whole issue he was in addiction he was he was in chaos he stood up on Saturday, last Saturday. He's now doing a FETAC level six. Um, he was telling us all how his smartphone has changed his life, texting and doing emails and all the rest. But I'm just saying, with the likes of that, it has happened organically. And the likes of the council, uh, Wicklow County Council and others, have seen what we do and they're there to support uh, our, our uh, application for transitional housing. Do you want to answer the second question? Um, yeah, you mentioned about state funding. Uh, we do. We get approximately a third of our operational budget for the residential uh, work at Tiglin comes through uh, mainly two drugs task forces. Um, in recent years, we have established links with the Department of Social Protection, and we've uh, brought in community employment in two forms. One form, we run a day service program, and I'll come back to that because you mentioned about other ways to, to help people as they exit treatment. The other uh, arm of the community employment is in the residential component as well. And the attraction of that is that, you know, we're, we're here talking about homelessness, but, you know, it's tied into addiction in, in ways. Um, Aubrey mentioned about a guy coming in who had educational difficulties. Education, 
uh, health, all of these things is taken care of within the residential facility at Tiglin. And community employment has been a great way to upskill people, give them back confidence, and help them exit uh, treatment with some form of a CV. Um, so it, 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 with that, we've also partnered with um, Carlo um, uh, IT, and they have uh, brought in education to the program. So people can leave Tiglin now with a, with a level six qualification. So it's, it's, it's very wraparound. Um, or we talked about there about a two year wraparound service. You know, uh, the journey of rehabilitation starts the moment somebody asks for help. And that can start well outside the bounds of a residential treatment program. It can start within the chaos of addiction while on the streets. And so they will need, you know, maybe detoxification or other health care issues to sort out prior to entry into programs like Tiglin. Um, and then afterwards, that step down into transitional accommodation is equally important. Um, and one of the things that we noticed was that sometimes people leave, they've got their treatment, they have their education, they may not be successful in securing employment or other accommodation. So that's why we established a day program, was that for a certain uh, type of individual that needed that extra bit of support, they had somewhere to go during the day, they had continuing education supports and other housing options were introduced there at that point. And also then that, that community employment knit them into other employment options. So that's kind that whole wraparound thing from the journey from the streets back into that aftercare and that takes time. Do you mind if I ask you one technical question? Sorry Deputy O'Brien you mentioned you got a certain amount of state funding. You also mentioned at the start you did a certain amount of fundraising yourself um, you're a not-for-profit organisation. You're running at a deficit and you make the deficit up by fundraising yes? Yes. On an annual basis how much do you fundraise if you don't mind telling? The Between three and four hundred thousand um, I mean even at Christmas uh, there we had judges from the district court down in Tesco, uh, bagpacking for us in Nace. Uh, so the people know what we're doing, they appreciate what we're doing, and they get behind it. Um, we get referrals from the state, from state bodies, councils, and uh, probation services, etc. And yet, uh, you mentioned Deputy O'Brien about funding. Um, the East Coast Drugs Task Force fund five beds. Um, at the moment, we would have eight to ten people from the East Coast. Um, and then we, South Inner City Drugs Task Force, they supply funding for three staff members and they supply other funding, outreach workers, etc. But uh, I'm a voluntary chairman. Um, I have a business in Deputy Durkin's area. And um, I, my job is to sort of fundraise and, and push it. But there's only so much that volunt voluntary bodies can do. And, and uh, I think I've gone around everybody's door with a begging bowl. And uh, I mean, they're sick of seeing me coming. And uh, so that can only go on for so long. So in order to see the likes of Niall and people like Niall getting their lives back on track, um, this was my sort of idea. Well, this is how the state can come on board without it costing the state any further money. You asked, did we, um, did we put this proposal before to the DSP, for example. We did. Um, I put it to a previous minister, Minister White, and I got a letter back stating that um, it, it, there was two elements to it. There was the um, rental allowance, but it was also the GP methadone type of allowance. And basically I was told in a letter very politely that the more people that Tiglin has coming off methadone or drugs or whatever, the more people the state has going on them. So therefore there's no real cost saving. Deputy O'Brien, I have, I have other but I'll let you finish this point, Deputy O'Brien. Yes. Uh, and, and I hope the judges put something in the bags they were packing as well as, as <laughs> shaking them. Um, do you have a waiting list? How many beds do you have between the two residential centres and what kind of waiting list do you have to get into them? The, um, the bed numbers, uh, as already said, we have uh, 30 for men and uh, up to 10 for women. Uh, but that, that doesn't include the aftercare step down. There's also another, uh, there would be another 12 beds including uh, that on top of that. So um, after our, the waiting lists, there's always a waiting list for residential treatment. And one of the things that we find is trying to motivate people on the waiting list is very important. Because if you're waiting to get in, you need to look at other options. We want to get that. We, we, we would love to strike while the iron's hot and take somebody in within a couple of weeks of asking to come, but that's not always possible. So uh, at the moment, I know that the waiting list can climb anywhere from the lowest I've seen it in the last few years is 35 people. 
I've seen it up over 100 people. But what we're always trying to do is say, OK, well, can we offer you other help? Is there other places that might have a shorter list or whatever? So it's not like we're trying to say, hold you here until, you're, until your bed comes up. We're always looking for other options. We also have um, two workers that uh, that was their role, was to kind of help in the community setting. And one of the things would have been that very thing, to look at options of waiting. Thank you. Right, a couple of more questions. Deputy O'Sullivan. Thanks very much. Um, it's good to see you all again. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Tiglin and I've been on the bus several times, so I know firsthand the, the work that you do and the way you reach out to people and the dignified way you do it and a respectful way for those who are homeless and in addiction. Um, I suppose one question would be just back to the addiction, your capacity, because I know Tiglin, the physical building, you have capacity for more. What would it take? to do that. So that's one more in relation to the addiction rather than the, the homelessness part. Um, after the transitional housing, I know quite a number of people are in recovery, they can go back to their family of origin, but some can't. And what sort of support are you getting for housing for them? Those who come into residential who are living in local authority housing, particularly if they're on their own, um, are, and they're going to be in residential for over a year, are they under pressure to perhaps surrender that uh, and the hope of getting it back or can they hold on to that because I think that, that was an issue other times. The other one is um, links with prisoners, people coming out of prison whether they come out addicted or um, we're trying to battle their addiction while in prison, have you um, connections with them and I know you have a mixture of nationalities who are availing of the service so it might be an idea to let us know of the, the range of people, not just Irish, other nationalities that you're working with. Thank Thanks. you Deputy O'Sullivan, I'll take one more question with that. Deputy Coppinger. Hi, um, just welcome to the committee. Uh, I obviously welcome the fact that anyone would do work among addicts and to, to help with regard to homelessness. I just wanted to ask about your ethos because the question was asked by uh, other deputies uh, where you seeking to be a housing body and also you're obviously seeking a form of state subsidy so I think it's legitimate to ask. So I know you have a very strong Christian ethos um, and on your website it has that you believe literally in the Bible, um, that the Bible is the inspired and only infallible and authoritative written word of God. Now that's, that's fine, I represent people of all religions and no, no religions. But I'm just wondering how it can impact as well on your working with homeless people who may not be religious and also addicts who, be, be that through alcohol or drugs, a lot of the only um, kind of therapeutic options are linked with a religious um, ethos in, in Ireland traditionally and not just in Ireland so I'm just wondering is there any you know non-religious al alternatives as well um, would what proportion would become Christians who go through your program um, because the graduation ceremony takes place in Nazarene church so it's obviously it doesn't? Okay, in grey stones? Okay. Um, but like a, a literal belief in the Bible, we all know what a literal belief in the Bible can mean in terms of gay people. Um, it could mean that you would have not a good attitude to gay people, but I am just have to raise these questions because if you're seeking government funding, um, who, who might be homeless or, or who might be addicts. Um, just the last one is on your attitude to, to drugs. Uh, do you think drugs should be decriminalised, for example? Be interested to hear. And um, just one of the other questions would be: d donations have been raised for your organisation in the uh, the Dublin's Business Improvement District. Like a lot of the the boxes are there, and it was reported in this been in a newspaper article in the Star. Uh, but that same. BID has also opposed methadone clinics being cited in their areas and um, they've called for them to be moved out of the city centre. So uh, I'm just raising it because it would seem that they're raising money for you but they're also then opposing methadone clinics being in, in accessible for people and they've also taken a very strong stance about what they call organised begging. Now we all know that a lot of homeless people or addicts, not a lot but a certain proportion, sorry, may resort to begging 
and I, I don't know what your attitude to that would be. Okay. So, uh, thank it. you. Just one point of clarification, uh, Deputy, uh, in terms of the, the proposal that was put <coughs> isn't specific to this organisation. It was a, it, this was for the voluntary residential groups, not solely for any one group. I just want to clarify that in case there's any misunderstanding. That was the, the, the presentation, um, if, I, if I understand it correctly. So it's not to prefer a unique position on one group over another, but any uh, um, of the voluntary residential rehabilitation centres that the rent payment would go with them. That was the proposal, and that's up to the committee to look at afterwards. But your questions now to Mr McCarthy. Just to uh, address what Maureen asked there about what would we do, you know, would we have extra space in Tiglin now. We've just recently moved our women's programme to a new facility, so there is up to, I suppose, a, an extra 10 beds that would be available there. Um, our, our, currently what we're doing is we're partially renovating some of the other rooms, so it's kind of come in handy at that point in time. But ideally we would like to use those, but there is a cost involved in that. Um, so we have the ability to help another 10 people. Currently it costs roughly 30,000 per person per year in treatment at Tiglin. So it's about trying to make sure that what we don't do is up our numbers w without upping the quality and the standard to each person. It could be very easy to just fill those beds. The need is there. But the quality and the care that's offered to each person will, will really diminish unless we improve staffing numbers alongside that, etc. So that's something that we're eager not to fall into a trap of. Um, so that, I hope that kind of answers what your, your question. In terms of support for housing, we don't get uh, any support for housing at the moment. Um, we're, we've been classified, uh, it's come back a couple of years, they classified us as an institution. So therefore people who are in institutions in the state cannot claim um, rent supplements and things like that. So one of the things we're not, we don't know how to change policy. Uh, we know how to help people in addiction and that's one of the reasons why we're asking you know, before the committee today is, is for guidance and, and to present this as a, as a viable solution. Um, so prison, um, what links? Prison, uh, we have links with prisons. Um, on a weekly basis we get letters from people um, who are looking to come to Tiglin uh, for all sorts of different motivations. Um, I know at one stage last year 25% of, our, uh, of our population had come from prison to Tiglin. Um, and you know that seems to be something that can go up and down but it, it's a consistent thing and also we've talked about the links between homelessness and addiction. The links also crossover, Niall talked about criminal behaviour and quite often pick up, people pick up charges and end up in prison because of that. So it is something, this is a really about joined up thinking here and uh, we, we, we do need to branch into that uh, uh, probation prison services for funding as well. And how many nationalities? Nationalities, um, most of the people that we're working with currently are Irish nationals, but on the bus, um, on the bus, uh, the, the outreach bus itself, there's probably 30% that would be non-national. Um, in the centre, at the moment, um, they're, they're all Irish nationals at the moment. Um, in the past, we might have one or two a year that could be, say, Eastern European or, or, or that, but not huge numbers will be coming in. They, you know, for, for one reason or another, maybe it's a language issue, things like that. They also don't seem to link in with many services on the street, so maybe that's another issue that uh, might uh, need to be addressed. Okay. Um, Deputy Carpenter, um, you mentioned about the faith-based um, aspect of Tiglin. Um, I, I was recently I had to go to the Matter Hospital, and as you go in, there's a marble plaque, and the marble plaque says, "We, the sisters of I don't know what the name is, uh, we carry on the business, following on in the way of Jesus Christ." Blah blah blah. But they are absolutely professional in every aspect of what they do. So Tiglin has a faith-based ethos, but we have bereavement counsellors. Our, our medical governance is overseen by Dr John Latham, who was used by the government when in, uh, implementing the methadone programme. So I personally have seen addiction in my own family, so that's what got me motivated. I, I don't care what background anybody's from or, or what religion they are, but if I see a, a person falling on the street, my motivation is to pick them up. So I, with Tiglin, we restrict 
14 module programme, and Niall can talk to you about that. Um, and it's, uh, you deal with di um, uh, attitudes is one of them, your personal responsibilities, your personal rights, growing through failure. So it's, it's basically a, a holistic approach. They, they do mindfulness, they have um, art therapists. So a lot of the, we have IT Carlo doing a programme so that now everybody that comes through the programme is coming out with an education. So if Ruth comes in, then when she leaves in a year's time, people say, where, where were you for the last year? Well, at least you have paperwork to show. Um, so if you're an atheist or, 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 a, or a Protestant, Catholic, whatever your religion is, you're very welcome to join our programme. Um, Niall can tell you about the ins and outs of the programme. Um, you mentioned about the Dublin Business DBID, I think it's called, I don't know what it stands for. They approached us and because I'm the one that's out fundraising, I was delighted with this idea. On paper, it read wonderful. It was on the news, it read wonderful. I, I think, uh, you mentioned boxes in different places. We've never seen them. Well, we have for very small amounts. I mean, but what was the total collection on that? You're talking, you know, a couple of thousand at max, you know what I mean? So I think the idea was wonderful that the Dublin Business District is helping the homeless and people in addiction. Um, it, it didn't translate. I don't know why, but it didn't translate. Uh, as regards to Dublin Bid, I, don't, I know the person, Richard, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. The head of it, but I don't know how it operates or anything like that. So we didn't approach them. They, they approached us about that. Thank you. Just one yes, point. Um, you just mentioned around, you know, discrimination around people's sexualities and all that. That would never even come into the programme at Tiglin. Like, we, we, we couldn't or we wouldn't want to discriminate against somebody because of their sexual background or their belief system or their non-belief system. Uh, so just to hope that clarifies. Thank you. Thompson. Uh, Deputy Catherine Byrne. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I was a bit late in the beginning. Well, congratulations to the three of you. Um, I went to Tigling a long time ago. I visited, uh, it was a good few years ago. And uh, I suppose the one thing that did hit me about it was the ethos around uh, like the 12 steps kind of model. It wasn't just, I know, a religious kind of thing, it was the 12 steps and how people, their well being and, and the reality of life and everything else. And I thought it was a wonderful model. Um, I just want to thank you, Niall, uh, for your powerful, uh, your powerful statement. And I think it's here. Now my life is overwhelming with hope. And I think if any of us could say that, I think it's something that we could all bring into our own lives. That sometimes our lives aren't overwhelming with hope, but certainly where you've come from and where you are now is real inspiration, I think, to those people who are working with you, but above all to others who are in the programme as well and they see people coming out the other end. And I think you said something about 78% of people have some kind of qualification or something coming out. It isn't always translate into when people leave somewhere like Tigling that they can go into home, another home, or they can get a job, and you're right there. But at least people, when they leave, have something to bring with them, because going in, they certainly didn't have it. But coming out, I've met some people I know down through the years who've been through the programme, but coming out, they're a different person, and they have a future, and that's something that they didn't have when they were going in. So just to say to you, well done on that. Uh, I suppose, um, I don't have a lot of questions, just probably one, I suppose, around um, how do you continue to receive your, your referrals, you know, how, how does that happen? And is there an age limit, because I can't remember, because it was a number of years ago when I was there, and basically that's it. But congratulations, because I really think something like Tigling is something of a model that we should really help when we have people like yourself who are struggling in addiction and are probably put into a flat or one room and really they're lost because there's nothing happening around them. But I do I do really sincerely uh, agree with you that I really believe that people in a programme like yours should be given some kind of a rent supplement or a rent allowance because you're actually housing them and you are doing probably a job a lot better than maybe putting people into a, a dark room on their own. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Butler. Um, thank you very much as well for the presentation. Just one quick question maybe to Niall. Niall, were you actually 16 months a resident of Tiglin? I wouldn't be familiar with it now before today. I, I'm from the south of the, uh, the country and I hadn't heard of it before. So I'm just wondering, were you, were you actually 16 months as a resident that you stayed there the whole time? Yeah, the whole programme. All right. Yeah. There was one stage on the programme after about I think 10 months where I was struggling a lot um, and uh, 
I came to the conclusion that you know I didn't need this anymore and I'd gone far enough. So I left Higlin and uh, found a flat and within six weeks I was back um, homeless again and Phil took me back in. I finished off my treatment and dealt with those deeper issues and was able to walk in freedom after that, you know. Congratulations, you're an inspiration to us all here today. Thanks. Just before we conclude, I just want to refer specifically to your proposition and your proposals as we're clearing it. Um, first of all, you, for, for Tiglin, you indicated that 72% or almost three out of four people presenting had a homeless issue. And I suppose the question I'd like to ask you, is that particular to Tiglin or do you believe that to be the case across most of the, because this isn't a Tiglin issue, this is across the rest of the residential rehabilitation centres. So is homelessness key in the broader sense? And secondly, the proposition um, that you make You've indicated, and I just was struck by when Deputy Butler was speaking, that the length of time that people are in uh, treatment with Tiglin is longer than some of the others. Um, so I suppose from a committee's point of view, if somebody's going in for two weeks or four weeks, uh, rent allowance isn't the same issue as if somebody's going in for six months or 12 months. Um, so you might like to comment on what normal duration is, but I can't see a proposal for two weeks and rent allowance following being the same as for six months or a longer term commitment or step down and so forth. So you might just like to comment on those areas. Uh, Chairman, I recently completed a master's degree and as part of that I focused on Tiglin and about how um, the longevity of the programme would uh, be beneficial to treatment or would be disadvantaged uh, to, uh, towards treatment. And um, I haven't got the percentage, I should know them off by heart, but uh, through interviewing the students that have graduated, uh, the longevity of the programme is where it seems uh, to be at. And the longer the person engaged, and Niall mentioned about his own, the longer the person engaged with the programme, the more successful the outcome is. So it's important to have a long programme, and that is we found. What was the first part of your question, sorry? Uh, I suppose... Uh... Um, I, I asked the three out of four uh, being homeless, is that unique to Tiglin or is that across all the residents? I sit on a voluntary cluster um, um, for Dublin City down the east coast as well and so I sit on it with Tony Gagan and Tony Duffin and, and different people that are involved in the various uh, professional rehabilitation centres and I rang Tony before coming in here to say this is the proposal and he said absolutely it affects each centre each residential rehab centre um, I don't have the percentages for them, maybe Phil would have them but uh, certainly it is across the board and that's why this proposal proposal um, is not for Tiglin, but it is for approved, accredited residential rehab centres. Finally, and then you can make your own closing statement, just so as we understand, you had, a, you had looked at this before, and during one of your answers you said this was refused because Tiglin was referred to as an institution, yes. and that was the only reason? Yes. There, yes, they said there would be no cost saving, and it's an institution. Okay. Um, if you'd have any concluding remarks, uh, either yourself or Mr. Thompson or no, Murphy, you're more than welcome to make them. Oh, so sorry, just, sorry, one second. Sorry. Deputy no, Wallace, did you want to get in? No, yeah, I wasn't actually going to ask any question, just to uh, compliment you. Um, it's a very uh, interesting presentation and uh, it's great what uh, you seem to have achieved. Well done. Thank you, Deputy. It's over. Committee members, um, for those of you who haven't been to Tiglin, I'd love to extend an invitation that if anybody would like to come up and meet the guys, meet the girls, uh, if you want to get in touch, my email is chairman at tiglin.ie. We'd love to show you around and see how the programme actually works. Um, on behalf of myself and the guys and also Tiglin itself, we just, we just want to reiterate that this solution that I've put forward is very workable. It shouldn't cost the state anything extra and I believe there will be results and hopefully in a couple of years' time you'll be in talking about the results of the decisions you've made. Thanks a million. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to answer, how, do you, how are your clients referred? Yeah, referred. Sorry, just... Yeah, I wasn't sure if we'd have enough time to get to that. Yeah, um, but the, um, obviously, because we're talking about a uh, homeless issue, we do receive um, referrals through homeless services around the city. Um, prison link workers um, are, are quite an interesting referral source as well, because they're spotting the motivation on the landings that they operate from. Um, probation services, we have really good strong links with probation services. GPs. Um, rehab integration workers and, and they're for, for the rest of the committee their role is basically to help somebody track their journey throughout addiction so from the first very first phone call right the way through to re-entry into society 
they've been a valuable source of referral for us as well around the country. Um, we get a lot of word of mouth referrals and what we try to do at word of mouth referrals is link them in with a local service and that the, a comprehensive needs assessment can be done locally and then that referral can be sent up to, uh, to Tiglin. It's also interesting, Deputy, about um, RTE did a programme a while back and it was focused on a guy who was well known in a certain area of Dublin. And this guy now has a fantastic job and he's married and he's doing really well. And the amount of referrals, people that self-referred, the website crashed because of people wanting to know, well, if he could do it, there's hope for us all. Yeah. And is there an age group? Is there an age limit? Over 18. Over 18. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr McCarthy, Mr Thompson, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and answering the questions. Uh, Niall Murphy in particular, uh, thank you for, I suppose, the bravery to come and tell your story, you know, in a format like this. It's, it's much appreciated. And I suppose one of the remits to the committee was would people come with recommendations? And I suppose you made your recommendation. It's up for the committee to discuss that now. Thank you uh, for your attendance here today. We'll suspend for a few moments and uh, then we'll have the, the next session. Thank you very much.
Okay, we're now in public session, and I'm pleased to welcome residents this afternoon from Tyrrellstown uh, in Dublin, Ms. Dobin, Ms. Uh, Murphy, and Mr. Cleary. Um, you've submitted to us a presentation. As I indicated earlier on, that'll be um, on the uh, website after the meeting. It's been circulated to members, but if you'd like to make an opening statement, and then the colleagues uh, will have a number of questions for you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. My name is Funke Tobon. I'm one of the residents, 40 residents that got the eviction letter. With me here today, I have Julian Murphy. She's one of the residents. And this is Charlie. He's a member of the, com um, the community. He's the local GAA coach. Um, we 40 members of the community got eviction letter starting in February the 9th. And um, then we set up the action group in March. Seeing this eviction letter has been a heartbroken for every one of us. This is not about the tenant, this is about the community. We are a small community and we live in one. This is a community that have multicultural people. We have over 120 different people living in the community. It has been a very stressful time for me since I'm February, I got the letter. Last year, he increased the rent from 1350 for a three-bedroom house to 1450 I told him I was going to move out of the house. But the whole of last year, we searched everywhere. The house wasn't there. So it is very challenging. We have children that go to the local schools, primary and secondary school, play in the local footballs. I have traveled all around Dublin with Charlie, taking my son to play a GAA game. This is what our community is all about. So it is very heartbroken for every one of us that got the eviction letter in February this year. So all, we have all the help from the community, from the club to support us, every one of us that we are going through this stress at the minute. If you want to know more about the voucher funds and the property owner, you can please go to Appendix 1. As you know, Dublin 15 is a very black, Dublin West as a whole is a black spot for homeless crisis. When I called for a house last year, I was lucky to be called to view the house. We are 15 family checking the house with children everywhere. I have no chance of getting the house. And you have the money to get the house, but the houses are not there. So getting a house in Dublin 15 is very difficult. And this is an area that has 38,000 houses, properties. When you go on the internet, you are looking around 50 houses being advertised in Dublin West alone. When you are looking at the 50 houses, you are looking at one bedroom at 1,200. <laughs> and you might see only two been advertised, and here you have about 50 families coming to view the house. So we don't have any chance at all. When you look at two bedroom, it's been advertised for 1,003, 1,004, and very low number as well being advertised. And when you go on the council as well, we have over 6,000 people waiting on the council list. I'm waiting for eight and a half years on council list. And many other people as well in the group has been waiting for over 10 years also for the council house. And here, about five years now, the council has never built a single home in Dublin 15, which is very difficult for every one of us at the minute. We are appealing to the government to find a solution to this problem, to come to our rescue from the hands of the vulture funds. It's terrorist time today. We don't know which community is going to be next. These are 40 families. This is, our, this is our community. We have no place to go. I have made my home there. I have called Island my home. So why should I be homeless? Why should I be thrown away from my home? I have lived in terrorist town for 13 and a half years. That is my second house in terrorist town. I have lived in this very particular property for eight and a half years. I have made it a home. So we are appealing to the community today to look into our condition, to put every one of us in your shoe, to see what we are going through. I'm a mother of three. I had a child with a special needs, which the school has already prepared the fund, resources, 
to keep the boy in the school. He's starting his school in September. So we have many other people as well that have the same problem with children with special needs, and the school have the resources to put them there. And they are vulnerable children. You know, it's heartbroken to throw them away from the community. We want the government to come in here to acquire these units. All, every member of the group has that. We are already set to acquire, the, we want to buy it. We want the government to buy this unit and set it up as an affordable mortgage in a very low affordable mortgage so we can be able to buy these houses and remain in our community. We are paying, I'm paying 1,450 for a three bedroom house. There is no way I'm going to be able to raise 16,000 euro for the scheme the council have set up to acquire, it to take a loan from a council to buy a house. So it is very difficult to be able to save up to 16,000 euro to buy a house. So we are appealing to the, gov to go to the to community here to look into our condition. As you know, last year, November to December, the department acquired 44 units in Waterville in Dublin 15 area. And this only cost 13 million to acquire these homes. So we are appealing here they should come to our rescue from the, house on the, the hands of the virtual phone and you know, acquire these units to keep every one of us here. And we are making it that if they set it up as an affordable mortgage, every one of us are going to buy. Those that are renting allowance can be able to rent in any different scheme the government wants to set up for them to remain in the community where they have made their home. So we, I'm, I'm presenting this here today for the government to look into it. As you know, we have over 100 houses in terrorist town that is coming up for sale. And this is going to cost the government from the research we did, 20,000 to 24, 20 million, 20 to 24 million. So, and the developer is owing government as well, which is the state fund. So why can't the government take this money to acquire these units to keep every one of us in our home so we can move on with our life? We work locally. It doesn't look nice to throw us, you know, we're ending up homeless, living where we live, we work, traveling or from another kilometers coming down to Dublin West to work. So we are appealing today for the government to come in and find a solution to our problem. So I'm going to take pass over to Julian if she has any one or two things she want to put in. Thanks for having me. I just want to say, since I received the letter, I have a mother of three, and my oldest son is five, my middle son is four, and my baby is two. Now, my middle son has special needs, he was diagnosed with autism last in February. And the impact that has on us is so hard. We're having sleepless nights, but not only that, I have to look it in a house within Dublin 15 because my son won't get the services he needs with his occupation therapy and things like that. And we got told if we live, leave Dublin 15, we'd be taken off the list and wherever we find a new home, we'd be start from the end again. You're waiting for nearly two years to get seen, to, to get the help for your kids. Now, my son, as Funky said, is in with the GEA and the community, the kids don't want to leave. And all we're asking is to come to our rescue because it's just having sleepless nights and we are mentally wore out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cleary, do you want to, would you like to say anything at this stage? Just <laughs> at the moment, not really. Like, just knowing that, that uh, with the GEA, like, as Funky said, like, the GA, like, there's, within the, the, the GA and Tirolistown, there is, I'd say about 60% of it is for, is for a national, different nationality, so there is, if not more, from different nationalities. When we go down in the morning, like, of a Saturday morning, there would be, in the, I look after the under nines, I look after the seniors, I look after the, the juniors, but when we go down, like, for the under nines, especially the Saturday morning, there's all different nationalities that would help them put a pause, getting the thing, getting the, the pitch ready, getting everything ready, like, when you go home to Washington for the, for the, for the, this is at the building up over years. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is built up, I say, under nines, under twelves, over twelve years. Like, when these are going to be, if they ever are to try to, to move them on or try to sell their houses or whatever, like them kids, the mothers, the parents, they're going to go, that's the, the community is just, it's torn to bits, like it's torn to shreds, so it is. When they go, like they're going to go, their kids are going to go. The, the, I can go a bit more into the GA as well, which is, if, 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 is, if, if it's like into the, the piece of land that we're on at the moment, the GA, like. That is part of NAMA, so it is at the moment, uh, NAMA at the moment, like. We 
and the community, we all got together. We had to fundraise 24,000 to put that into a playing pitches for the kids and for a senior team and put a junior pitch on it. We got no funding really nowhere from anyone. We just we got together, we, we worked together, we put that in there. They're all working there, they're all playing together now on it, like, which is brilliant. Now, with, when that's all built up now, now at the moment, they are threatening us to put us off it. Now, it's not because it's, I'm just here like say, to, to express the pitches, but if we go off that in the morning, the GA club is gone. We are the only outdoor football sport, it, actually the only outdoor sport as in Terrellstown. If that goes, the whole community is totally shreds again. It, it is, the, the, the parents go as, the kids go as, it's, like, it's, it's unreal, like, it's, un, it's just, I can't find words to describe it really, like, you know, like, how, how, how bad it is, like, and there's other issues in Tirolstown as well as so there is, not alone that, like, last two weeks, like, three weeks, there's people coming to me, like, and this is getting a bit away, like, well, there's management companies in Tirolstown, there's so many people to court for, in, in, in Tirolstown, so they are, for non-payment of fees, and not paying the fees, I say, which really can't afford to, to pay them, like. Like, Tillerstown is just 2,300,000 houses in it, like. Like, how, how, how do these management companies work in the Tillerstown, like? How, like, how did they even get into Tillerstown? Like, like, I just, like, I'd like to invite maybe everyone who's out, and myself and, and, and Fungi and, and Julian, me, which is in Tillerstown, and do just a half an hour or one hour walk around Tillerstown and just show you exactly what is happening in Tyrrellstown. There's a road going to the school, and no one owns the road. There's access to the school, no one, and there's no one putting their hands up and saying, I'm maintaining that road, I'm doing that to that road. You don't even know, like, like that carries, there's a community centre, two schools down there, that carries all the people that's going to them, to, to, them to, to the community centre and two schools. Like. If an accident happens there, Who's like, like insurance wise? There's no one maintaining it. It's like, but even for the kids going to school, it's a nice sort for the kids and the parents going to school. Going to, like, I've been baiting on the door, I don't know how long about this. Like, I was in even hurling and all. I don't want to mean to go on because like, there's more important things with the house. Like, but it's unreal though. Like, it's unreal. What's happening to these in Cruise Park as well? Like, just shouldn't be happening. Like, we shouldn't be sitting here at a round table here. This, this shouldn't be allowed. There's no way should it be allowed. That's my really opinion of it as was. Well. I just want to make a point. A um, couple of months ago, the former Minister of Environment invited us in. I and Julian went and we told him this is our presentation. What do you have to do? Consider every one of us. He told us that the government are in negotiation with this developer to acquire these units. And since then, we have not had anything. And we know that the government can purchase these units to keep every one of us. And we're appealing to the new housing minister, and we welcome the idea that the government has set a committee for housing and homeless crisis and a new minister for housing. We want them to start from where the previous minister stopped to push the developer to acquire these units. We have nowhere to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A number of colleagues uh, have some questions, and as they're asked, whoever feels they want to answer them, feel free. Deputy O'Brien, to start with. Th thanks, Chair, and, and thank you all for the presentations, and particularly to, to yourselves, obviously li living through the, the stress of, of the situation. I don't have a question, but I just there's some information I just want to share with the meeting, because I think it might be helpful in terms of, of coming up with recommendations that, that are supporting the, the residents. Um, and putting pressure on the government on this. I mean, the first thing is what, what's really significant about Tyrrellstown is what you're experiencing was happening to a large number of families before Tyrrellstown, but they were isolated families. You had a house here, you had a house there that was being repossessed, and the family was having to deal with it on their own. The fact that there are so many in such uh, a concentrated place, I think, has really shown a spotlight on a particular problem that this committee needs to consider. There are 40,000 mortgages, including uh, the mortgages on the houses that you're living in uh, that have been bought by what are called short-term investment funds, uh, what we call vulture funds. And the reason why they're called short-term is because they're not buying the properties to allow people to remain living in them uh, and taking the rental income. Their intention is when it is a, uh, uh, suitable to them, they will sell them on irrespective of the consequences for the people uh, living there. Uh, and we expect they'll sell them on very shortly. 
10,000 of those are properties that have been bought and 30,000 are just the debt that have been bought. So what that means is, uh, in a very short period of time, we are going to be seeing right across the state far more situations like Tyrrell's Town. So it's not just about us trying to identify a solution that works for, for your families, although I think we have to do that. By finding a solution for your families, we're recommending to government a solution to the problems overall. Now, my understanding is the housing agency has looked at the, these figures uh, and they are trying to impress upon the Department of Environment very credible solutions that would allow families like your own to stay in your homes, uh, to be secure in your communities, uh, in a way that wouldn't necessarily place undue financial burden on the state, uh, because these are rental properties with a, a rental income. So one of the things I'd like this committee to do on the back of the hearing today is to write to the housing agency and to the Department of Environment uh, specifically in relation to this issue and ask for whatever correspondence has gone between the Department of Environment and the Housing Agency on the types of solutions that the agency thinks are practicable to keep people in their homes. Uh, Dear Fred, I, I, I'm agreeing to do that, but we might also include the Minister, because the Minister will be our final witness and that it, it, it will allow you an opportunity it, to... It would be very useful for us to have that information prior to Minister Coveney coming in, because obviously the request you're making to us is that we go to the new Minister to say, what are you going to do to the request that was put to Alan Kelly some months ago? There, there are ways of the state facilitating the purchase of these houses. Um, uh, and putting in place models that would main, mean when other Tyrrells towns emerge as they do, uh, uh, families can be kept in their homes. So I just think the one immediate thing we can do as a committee is get that information so that when we produce our report in a couple of weeks' time, it has very, very clear recommendations to deal with these kinds of crises. Because if we don't do that, your families and the hundreds if not thousands of families that are going to come down the line afterwards will also be entering into the homeless system, which is part of what we're trying to prevent. So just to say you certainly have the support of, of TDs like myself, but I think we need that information to be able to, to progress the solutions. And I'm agreeing, and I, I, I suppose the only extra bit was to include the department in, in the correspondence so they'd be somewhat prepared. Absolutely. From there. Um, I suppose that was a statement rather than a question. Well, it's, it's just a big, 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 I, mean, I think you're asking us to come up with the practical solutions, and I'm saying I think there are solutions there. That information would help the us. The committee is in agreement with that proposal. Yes. Okay. Deputy um, Coppinger. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I suppose I think the heartfelt words of the residents here, I hope, will be listened to by all of the TDs here today because. Um, Obviously, I, my daughter goes to school in Tyrrellstown. I, I know the residents all very well. I live practically right beside it. So I think the frustrations that were expressed by uh, Charlie as well, this is an area, just to stress to all of the TDs, that's been really underserved by the state. It's been badly dealt with. It's an area of 2,500 homes in quite close proximity, high density the kind of high density living that everyone was told we all needed in the boom. And their pitch that is referred to is the only outdoor sporting facility in that area. Like imagine a large town around the country anywhere that would be using something like that. Uh, there is not one council provided facility yet because the same developers that own those houses that got them acquired by the Vulture Fund did a very strange deal with the local authority. But the reason this is relevant is, like these, the people in Tyrrellstown are not asking for handouts or anything. They've been badly served, very badly served in terms of facilities, playing pitches. When I was on the council, we'd constantly campaign. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, the, how did this all happen? This is very relevant to some of the other discussions we've had on this committee about the vulture funds because the link between the vulture funds and the, the residents here is Beltony, which is the Irish subsidiary of Goldman Sachs, has bought these units. Now, the government is not neutral in this. They knew quite well that all of these portfolios were being bought up and they did nothing about it. So it isn't an accident that this happened or happened behind anybody's back. Um, Beltony spent 760 million buying portfolios in Ireland from March 2014 to 15 in one year. That's what it bought up. 
The biggest one was from the IBRC, so the government had to know because that was a state. They were Michael Noonan would have been kept informed, the Minister of the Department, regularly of reports of what was being sold. And 187 million from Ulster Bank, which owned these loans. So, um, you know, there's a bit of information there, but the reason this is relevant is Goldman Sachs has a relationship with the government on several fronts. Um, it's been given permission to investigate banks and all sorts of things, and I think we just have to recognise that it was government policy to see all of these things being dealt with quickly, and here we have the human effect of it. The, the difference between, it's not that I love the native Irish like developer or you know, capitalist, I, I don't. It's not that I have any special affinity with them. But the difference is, as we've heard, in one foul swoop, 40 people can get an eviction notice and be pressured to leave an area. Now, some people have left already because they were so afraid. And what's happened to them, one family has gone up the road to Fibsborough and is paying 2,000 euros in rent. There is another family that, that is in emergency accommodation for months that left another property right beside where the others live that was owned by a bank as well, not in this case. She's in emergency accommodation. That will be the fate of these people if we allow it to happen. Like, it, it, this isn't uh, accidental. The case has been explained, and I yeah. suppose I do want to focus on the job in hand. Are there proposals or questions? Yeah, like, well, I'm just I'm, giving a bit of background no, about the vulture I, I, fund I'm as well. I'm accepting the background, but so, I, I want to make sure that we... You yeah, know, we... in terms of solutions, yeah. right, um, and just looking at what's outlined in the document, the, the only surefire solution to stop people becoming homeless is if the state acquires these properties. Um, in this case, there's 40, but really there's potentially 150 to 200 um, because other people could get a notice at any time. But let's say there's 100 houses in, in particular. If the state acquired those, say it was the council, Fingal County Council, who have been negotiating with the developer for months and months and months. Now, if that developer doesn't buy, doesn't agree to sell them, we're in a difficulty because... We do need the type of legislation we've been talking about, which is CPO, to acquire distressed properties if the developer doesn't agree. Now, he, he may agree, or they may agree, and if they do, what do we do with the people who are in them? Some of the people are on the council's housing list already. We did, we did a survey of the tenants um, affected. Two-thirds of people were you know, working, paying a full rent, and a third, roughly, were on rent supplement. So um, even some of the people who were paying a full mortgage are on the council's list as well. But my point is, you can't just bring in a, the, the usual scheme of turfing the people out and bringing in council tenants. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Um, the reason I raise it is, that's what the council is currently talking about. Um, and we have to say in the committee that a new... For, for people who are in situ in houses where the council is buying them, something new has to be uh, brought in. So what I would suggest is that those who are paying a rent now of 1450 are more than capable of paying a mortgage. My mortgage is half of that. I bought an affordable house off the council 13 years ago. So um, the only difficulty would be this deposit issue, which is why it's put into the uh, submission. And the way around that, people could continue to pay a much higher rent, like, you know, maybe continue to pay your 1400 for a period of time, and you have your deposit then worked up after, you know, very quickly, and then you would reduce down to, you know, this, I'm just saying we need a bit of imaginative ways, and I think that those who are on rent supplement or on the council's list should be made council tenants in those properties. Um, but... Uh, the reason I raise it, Chair, is just the last point, is there's a bit of a tendency for the Council to want to house homeless people. Right? Now, we all favour that because we all are dealing with the homeless families and we want them housed. But um, I think that there's a bit of a reluctance by Councils to step in here because it isn't dealing with their homeless list. But the reality is that their homeless list will be severely added to if, if people are... Yeah. So the reason I raise it is this is the first template for vulture fund properties, and these are some of the things that we have to make recommendations on. Thank you, uh, thank you Deputy. And uh, while agreeing with you, just to, to broaden the point, that the recommendations will have to be of a nature that they won't just be for 
this cohort, to go back to what Deputy O'Brien said earlier, you know, our recommendations have to be across across the board, and there are two. Task case. But there are two elements to it. One is one is the acquisition of the properties, and then recognising that the people who are in it uh, have to be serviced in different ways because they have different needs. They're not all going to be uh, uh, mortgage schemes or local authority tenants. There's going to be a mix, and that has to apply in the broader community that if, if the state can manage to, to buy them. So they will form part of the, the, the piece of work that we need to do. Deputy Durkin. Uh, Mr Chairman, you'd be shocked uh, 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 to know that I agreed almost entirely with the uh, last speaker. Uh, 